My dear friends in Christ Jesus, children of the Heavenly Father, as a transplant to Minnesota, I had a, an opportunity to observe the people of Minnesota laughing. For a long, long time, the Golden Gophers had languished at the bottom of the Big Ten. But this year, miracle of miracles, they excelled and everybody was laughing with joy as they rolled up one victory after another. Look who's laughing now. Until they played Wisconsin. And then all of a sudden, all of the laughter and all of the hopes and all of the dreams were just shattered in a million pieces. But neither the Golden Gophers nor the Wisconsin Badgers are a suitable team to select for this evening's sermon. So I picked Rutgers. Last time I looked, Rutgers was 0-9 in the Big Ten. I don't know what happened last Saturday, but I wouldn't be a surprise if they were 0-10. And, and so I'm imagining going into the locker room at the end of a very long season at Rutgers and walking up to one of those enormous tackles. He'd have to be a junior. And I say to him, you know what's going to happen next year at this time? Next year at this time, you are going to be the victors of the NCAA Division I championship. Big Ten is nothing. You're going to be at the top of the aisle. And the tackle would look at me and laugh like Abraham did and said, huh, I just hope we win one game. Assemble the team and tell them, next year at this time, you are going to be NCAA champions. And they laugh and they say, yeah, right, that's impossible. And so when we think about people who are laughing, it isn't always because they're happy. They have heard this enormous an amazing promise, but reality suggests that it ought to be something quite a bit smaller. Somebody has offered him something that is actually impossible. Huh. Yeah, right. But then fast forward one year. And miracle of miracles beyond any expectation and contrary to all the polls, Rutgers. Yes, Rutgers is NCAA champion in Division I football. And now go in the locker room and look who's laughing now. God came to Abraham and he said, I want you to look at the stars. And in the Middle East on a, sun, on a light night without the moon, there would be a bazillion of them. Count them, if you can. This is what your offspring is going to be like. 95 plus years old. He and his wife haven't been able to have children. Not only are they both too old, but Sarah never could have children. The promise is enormous. That his descendants would be like the stars of the sky. Count them if you can. But that wasn't the biggest one. In chapter 12 in Genesis, God promised that from you and your seed, from this child that you can't have, I am going to bring a blessing to every single family on earth. This is the promise of the Savior. And so when Abraham hears these promises, he not only sees this enormous gathering of nations, people without number, but eternal salvation offered to every one of them through the Son. God promised Sarah that she would be the mother of kings and princes. And so when you wonder why there are all of these lists of all of these people in the book of Genesis, because it wants you to count the nations. Dozens and dozens of them with king after king ruling over them. Just like God promised, this is a whopper. 
And you're going to have this child when you're 100 years old. And Sarah is going to be the mother. And Abraham says, Ha! Yeah, right. I just hope that at least my property won't go to some stranger. Maybe Eliezer of Damascus can take care of it. Did you ever notice how we confront these absolutely amazing promises in the Bible? God is guaranteed that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Oh, I just hope I can get through today. God has promised that absolutely everything happen, that will happen to you will be for your good. Well, I just hope the good outweighs the bad. And all of a sudden, we seem to be taking these enormous and gigantic promises of God and, ha, well, I hope that we can at least save one or two. The Bible promises that there will be a multitude that nobody can count in heaven. And people are hoping for 144,000 at the most. Ha! The promises are too big. And the faith required to believe those promises has to be big too. Sarah is listening behind the tent flap, isn't she? God has a chance to visit with Abraham and repeat the promises that he's made before about Sarah being the one that's going to have a son. Not Hagar, not some arranged thing with the, the, Sarah's slave girl. No, not Ishmael. I'm talking about Sarah. Huh. Why now? I'm 90 years old. I can't have children. I'm too old. And then look at my husband. He's, well, as good as dead is what the book of Hebrews says politely. This is impossible. Perhaps some of you have some sense of what I'm talking about, but this can't happen. And Sarah knew it. And so she laughs behind the tent and God says, why is she laughing? Oh, I didn't laugh. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> Wouldn't we? And this impossible to have child is not the only one in the scriptures. There will be this virgin that has a baby, which is of course, absolutely impossible. And that baby that she has will be called God with us, Emmanuel, which is also, come on, this can't happen. And so if you listen carefully, who's laughing? All the people who say that this stuff can't work. Those are the believers. And then there's another horde of people who believe that this can't work because, of course, virgins can't have babies. It's unscientific, and this is irrational and doesn't make any sense and cannot possibly believe God doesn't expect us to believe this stuff, does he? Huh. Let's get real. And so it is the impossibility of these promises. The fact that they cannot be done is exactly what God talks to Sarah about. With God, nothing is impossible. He'll repeat the same promises to Elizabeth, Zechariah, and to Mary. What should I do? I, you know, I'm virgins conceiving. Okay, uh, what's, where's my to-do list? Well, don't do anything. Just sit there, and uh, the Holy Spirit will take care of everything. And remember that the one who's made the promise is able to do everything. And now go into Sarah's tent. It is one year later. And this 90-year-old lady who can't have any children picks up her baby. Look who's laughing now. And on the eighth day, Abraham names him and circumcises him the mark of the promise of the Savior. 
And the name he gave the one that God told him, he's going to keep on laughing. God has made a promise. And I, so I'm wondering why God picks out that name. He keeps on laughing. And has Abraham and Sarah named their son that? I'm, I'm suspecting that it's a gentle reminder. Remember, Abraham, when you were laughing at these promises that are too big to keep? Look who's laughing now. Isaac is. Remember, Sarah, about those promises that are impossible for God to keep? Oh, look who's laughing now. It's Sarah. Oh, and when you celebrate Christmas, the birth of God with us, this absolutely impossible thing, and we're laughing. And then he is the one who brings salvation not only to us, but to offers and gives it to every single person in the entire world's history, all of the stars you can count. And we have this privilege, this message that we can send and pass on to everybody else in the world. And when we celebrate Christmas, I know who will be laughing. And when Jesus comes back in all of his glory and gathers this countless horde of people to himself in heaven, look who's laughing now. Amen.